Welcome back to the Anchored Podcast, the official podcast of the Classic Learning Test. My name is Soren Schwab, VP of Partnerships here at CLT. And today is part two of our conversation with Clark Durant, CEO of the Cornerstones Education Group, a charter management company that serves over 3,000 children across five campuses. For this second episode, we're also joined by our very good friend, Anika Prather. Dr. Prather earned her BA from Howard University in elementary education. She also has earned several graduate degrees in education from NYU and Howard University. She has a master's in liberal arts from St. John's College in in Annapolis and a PhD in English, theater and literacy education from the University of Maryland College Park. Her research focus is on building literacy with African-American students through engagement in the books of the canon. She is the author of Living in the Consolation of the Canon, the lived experiences of African-American students reading great books literature, which she self-published. Anika is also the co-author of the Black Intellectual Tradition, along with her fellow CLT board member, Dr. Angel Parm. She currently serves as Director of High Quality Curriculum and Instruction at Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy, and she's the founder of the Living Water School, a unique Christian school for independent learners based on the educational philosophies of classical education and the Sudbury model. In the spring of 2022, Anika and her husband opened the Living Water Center, uh, located in Alexandria, Maryland, where activities for the Living Water School, book talks, and other events are hosted. She and her wonderful husband, Damon, have three young children, and they reside not far from the CLT offices uh, in the DC metropolitan area. Uh, Clark, Anika, we're so delighted to have you on today. Thank you. Our pleasure. And it's Alexandria, Virginia, actually. We moved to Virginia. Virginia, you're right. You're right. It's yeah, I should right know that. You. It's just on the street. You're right. Yeah. Gosh, I love King Street. Uh, yes. <laughs> charming, charming, charming town. Um, also, welcome back to our listeners. Uh, if you have not checked out Tuesday's episode with Clark, uh, I encourage you to do so. Clark has an amazing life story, and he is a fantastic storyteller, um, as I'm sure he will demonstrate again uh, here today. Uh, last time, Clark, we talked about how you're practicing law led to you founding the Cornerstone Stone Schools in Detroit. We learned about the school's history and mission and the transitioning of the schools to a classical model. Uh, We finished the episode by briefly talking about your good friend, Andrew J. Young. So I'd love to pick it up there, Clark. Tell us about the Andrew J. Young Cornerstone Center for Complete Life. Well, it's interesting, Soren, that you want to lead the conversation with that. Um, On July 3rd, just before Independence Day, Uh, Ambassador Young, I call him Andy, Andy called me um, to just get caught up. He was asking about the schools, about our teachers. Um, Andy had been married. His first wife, Jean, had been an elementary school teacher, the mother of their four children. And when Jean died, uh, Andy married another teacher, uh, Carolyn, and they've been married for well over 25 years now, uh, but both teachers. And Andy was just checking in uh given the independence day was coming up uh and so what was so precious about the call it was in october of 2021 uh that we did the dedication uh delta airlines uh the ceo ed bastion uh came up from atlanta and joined us with ambassador young in detroit uh on grove street to celebrate the creation of the Andrew J. Young Cornerstone Center for the Complete Life. And it was really a remarkable thing because it really began our journey uh, into the whole classical mindset, um, which is a mindset rich in seeking after the things that are good, the things that are just, the things that are true and beautiful. And our dedication closed with a very beautiful moment. If you recall, there's an iconic photograph um, of a a young uh, Reverend Andrew Young in the parking lot of a Baptist church with all these different civil rights leaders on their knees. And it is just, it's 1965, and it is just before they were about to begin a journey into hell across the Edmund Pettus Bridge. And all are on their knees and young Reverend Andrew Young is standing there with his hand outstretched 
And you can see that he is invoking and asking the love and the power of God to be with these men and women before they begin this journey. It's an iconic photograph, not well known. But as we finished the program, I got down from the little stage that we created, an auditorium full of children, their families, teachers, and staff. And I walked over to the ambassador and I asked him to close this journey of creating this center for a complete life. Now, that complete life, as the Reverend Dr. King taught us, is to live for a purpose born, to be a person for others and to know God. And so I said to the ambassador, I said, would you close our dedication with the prayer you gave that day in that parking lot in 1965? Now, Ambassador Young has had, you know, he's 90 years old now, 91, really. And he's got a little scooter, so he doesn't stand up very much. But you could see the way he began to try to rise, to stand on his own feet. And slowly he was pushing himself up and he reached his hand out just as he had done that day in 1965 and began to pray for the dedication and the gathering that we had. There was not mm -hmm. a sound to be heard except the silk and music of his voice. And it was a beautiful moment, but it's also a classical moment because going all the way back, um, uh, to Athens, to Socrates, to Plato, to Rome, Jerusalem, all of it is rooted in an ordered, un an understanding of an ordered universe and that there is a purpose for every person and that we have to live to that purpose. So for Cornerstone, that dedication with Ambassador Young, and I was very touched, honestly, uh, by his call. I mean, he can talk to anybody and I'm a nothing but he made that call on July 3rd. And we talked about um, the rich classical education that King had had because 60 years ago in 1963, King gave two very seminal and classical addresses. The first was a letter written from a Birmingham jail and that was in April of 1963. That August, it was on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, the I Have a Dream. And both of those um, remarks, talks, letters are richly enhanced because of his classical education. Mm -hmm. uh, we talked about other things. In fact, I'm um, sending out a letter to our Cornerstone Partner community tomorrow that reflects that dimension of learning. And Soren and Anika, I'll see that you get a copy too, and you can share it with your listeners. But it's a beautiful thing because we've begun a journey, uh, and I'm very grateful to Anika uh, and to her you know, co-author of the Black Intellectual Tradition, uh, Angel Parham. These are great woman, women in what they have done to open up the moral imagination for people to appreciate why all of us should be taking this journey to live a more full and flourishing human life. That is absolutely beautiful. Mm -hmm. And I can only agree, Clark, uh, and, and uh, as some of our listeners might know, both Anika and Angel uh, are, are serving on our board and we're just so grateful to have them. And, and one, <clears throat> during one quarter uh, last year, as a whole company, we read Anika and Angel's uh, book. And I encourage everyone to get a copy it's called The Black Intellectual Tradition by Classical Academic Press, published by Classical Academic Press. And it was just beautiful to see because I know both of you and, and reading the different chapters, you, I can hear you and I can hear Angel through your voice and your writing is different, um, but it is absolutely beautiful. Um, well, Anika and Clark, you have such a sweet relationship. I can tell just, you know, in the few minutes leading up to the, the recording. Anika, why don't you tell us uh, when did you first meet Clark or hear about Clark and, and where? Um, God is so amazing because I met Clark many years ago, um, before my daughter was even born. So it was probably about 12 years ago. Um, I was, I had just taken on a position of a principal as a principal at a school called Cornerstone DC. 
And um, I was hired because I had been serving at my parents' classical school, bringing classical education to uh, a Black community there. And they wanted to now really transition the school to being more classical, but just needed someone who had done it before. And so um, they sent me um, as part of my training, though, to Cornerstone DC to learn about fundraising and how... um, at that, at that time, I think one of your schools or some of your schools were were not charter yet. And so there was a whole fundraising process that they wanted me to learn that they were they, they had modeled themselves after. And so Cornerstone DC has really, I mean, Cornerstone Detroit has really been a, a model for schools that are bringing um, Christian or private school education to underserved populations without depending on um, um, the government, but using private funding. And so I went there and as you can see, that was 12 years ago, but I just never can forget Clark's personality. I he was a really had a really short meeting because most of my time was spent in the schools and visiting the schools and with the development team and different principals. And uh, there was a woman he was who was helping to lead the schools at the at the time. But I had Ernestine, a brief meeting. Ernestine Sanders. Yes, Ernestine Sanders, and and her my time with her was very memorable as well. But Clark, I can't I couldn't forget his name, his first and last name. I couldn't forget his face. And I think what made him so memorable is his passion for Detroit. Um, and he didn't have to be, you know, and a lot of times, you know, I'm, I know a lot of times people may read that and think different things, but when I met him, I saw such sincerity about bringing a quality education to this community, you know, and I was, my parents served a similar community and then Cornerstone was in one of the worst neighborhoods of Detroit, I mean, of DC, the one I was serving in. And those are communities that are often forgotten. Our, our own, sometimes our government in the public school system forgets these communities that deserve, these children, these families, deserves uh, uh, equitable education, just as good as any other child, no matter who their parent is or what neighborhood they live in. Um, and so... I was just really drawn to his passion for that. And I just never forgot it. Move on. I thought I'd never see him again. I did all my training and I just kept thinking about his his joy for this work. Um, and then um, a mutual friend of ours, Eric Twist, and I had developed a friendship through my work with Great Hearts. And Eric reached out to me. He said, listen, there's a there's a school. I just want you to, I've been telling the founder about you and have you ever heard of Clark Durant? I was like, oh, Clark, yes. And he says, well, they're wanting, to, he wants to make his schools classical. I said, oh, I would love to see him again. And, and so it was almost like we picked up from where we left off in that, that brief meeting. And, um, and I was just honored. My husband is from Detroit. He graduated from Detroit Public Schools. He grew up in the neighborhoods of Detroit. I, have, I go to Detroit at least twice a year to hang out with family and friends because all of my in-laws there and I also have some friends there. The church we attend, we have like a another church home in Detroit is right in the heart of Detroit. Um, um, and so I, yeah, I, I've developed a love and a heart for Detroit and that community myself. So this, this reconnection um, with Clark Rosedale, Rosedale Baptist Church was the name of the, that's the name of the church I attend when I go. But um, I felt this opportunity to reconnect with Clark started back then because I felt like God really connected us uh, with similar vision. And then the other part that I, and then, and so here we are reconnected again and I'm talking with Clark and even in what he's just shared with you, I, I think what really drew me is he constantly gets back to this great conversation that has involved involved all of our voices you know like coming into the classical world you just don't see people have that kind of a conversation where martin luther king is in dialogue with saint thomas aquinas you know or as even himself he's practicing it his relationship with andrew young you know and then you go to the visit the schools and you see the murals all around the school that he's really trying to pass that understanding onto that community that this 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 creation and founding and progress of America has been a joint effort 
with Blacks and whites and many others engaged in this great conversation around this literature that has shaped all of our thinking, uh, especially the thinking of our ancestors. And so I feel like this move of Cornerstone becoming classical is a natural, is a pretty, or it makes sense. It makes sense because it connects very much to the heart of Clark. Um, and and it, it is an embodiment of what I feel God wants for our communities, that it's not his will that we're segregated. And we know that racism plays a big part of that, but, but I feel, and I think, I know Clark agrees, we've talked about this. I feel, and Soren, you know what I'm about to say, that classics is like we need to gather around this fire of classics together our ancestors have been doing it right frederick yeah. Douglass did it with abraham lincoln martin luther king did it with um, all the different canon writers he wrote about and taught about at morehouse and it helped shape he says it in his autobiography these philosophers have shaped the civil rights movement for me and so i feel like if we can train the next generation to continue that legacy. And especially the communities that are often the most forgotten. What an example that would be to the world. What an example that would be to the world to see Clark and myself, who are as different as literal night and day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I play golf and she doesn't. <laughs> coming together for this common purpose to engage in this great conversation. And, and so sometimes people will ask me, why don't I talk about some of the, I'm not even gonna say the names, the different theories and philosophies that are out now. And I tell people, I'm having a whole other conversation. You can come over here and join me over at this conversation. Mm -hmm. We're not having these politically charged conversations. I just wanna have a conversation about our common humanity. And we model that by engaging with those who also wrote about common humanity of their time. And then we work through our differences. We come to understand each other's context, each other's stories. And then this, this, this work is involving training um, the young people to do that so they can carry on that legacy. So that's how, and, and all of that is connected to, I, I believe what connected Clark and I back then and what continues to forge our, our friendship even now. That, yeah. that is really, really special. Um, well, Clark, when you made the decision to to transition your, your, your schools to a, to a classical model, I mean, what was the thought process, not only going into it, but I mean, it seems like a, a, a large task. Where do, where do you start? Well, there's pedagogy, there's curriculum, there's what else is there? Uh, can you talk to us a little bit? And then, of course, how how you uh, ended up connecting with 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 Eric and then through Eric with with Anika and, and her role in that? Well, it started with um, me taking uh, five people uh, to New York City, um, but to have them visit the classical schools in the Bronx. There are five of them there, four of them there. Uh, but I did it in the context where we would spend time. Um, they didn't know the agenda. I knew the agenda. They just trusted me and we'll just go to New York. We'll spend two days. Um, so what was the experience? We obviously went to the charter schools in the Bronx, but I also took them to a play on Broadway, um, into the woods, uh, the Sondheim, uh, production, because there was a cornerstone graduate who had a role in that play on Broadway. And so we talked with him afterwards. I took them to a poetry reading that first things had sponsored in a sort of an upper warehouse loft, if you will. So they heard a poet from Louisiana uh, read poetry. Uh, it was a beautiful evening. We had, uh, you know, some cheese crackers, the usual things. Um, then we had further conversation back where we were staying. Um, I took um, some early in the morning, honestly, to mass. Uh, so that they could see in a very classically beautiful uh, New York church, um, the architecture, but also the liturgy uh, of the high mass. Um, and it was just an experience to begin to taste an aspect of this conversation. I like the way Anika talks about that, to taste this conversation in a couple of different venues. When we got back, 
um, a friend of mine, I was on the, um, I was chairman of the board of the Society of Gilbert Keith Chesterton. And as you know, they have almost 50 classical Catholic schools around the country. And um, one of the board members I recruited, I called and said, look, I'm thinking about this for Cornerstone. I don't want this to be my decision. I want it to be a decision that arises organically because it's the right direction to go. He recommended Eric Twist. Uh, so I invited Eric out to have dinner with some of our people and just to talk. Uh, then I gathered in a conference room, uh, two of our principals, our academic leader, and a couple of our strategic leader, and just to talk about what would this look like. On the, We were there for a few hours, to put it mildly. And then in that conversation, Eric brings out this book and he gives it to one of our principals, Monica Thompson, who was also on the trip to New York with me. And it's the black intellectual tradition, reading the classics on the road to freedom uh, by Anika and Angel. And <laughs> I'm looking over Monica's shoulder. I'm saying, Eric, you got another copy of that? <laughs> um, and Monica said, OK, Mr. Durant, you can read mine. I said, no, 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 you keep it. I'm a prime guy. I'll have it by tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, so anyway, I, I read it. I was very touched by the approach. And I, and I thought it was really good because both uh, Angel and Anika write in a different way and had a sort of a different emphasis, but that made it even better. Mm -hmm. So then I said, I need to take people that, that room in the conference room said, we're, you know, we'd like to go in this direction. You can't do... You got to have a small core, but you got to build from that. So then I identified with that group, 17 people that I would then take to Phoenix for the National Classical School Convention in February of this year. And I ordered enough copies. You know, Anika is going to be able to retire well. I've ordered so many copies of her book. <laughs> but anyway, uh, I ordered more than 18 copies, but I gave one to every person who was going to go with go with me. Uh, and then I made sure they had to read it before they go. And then, you know, when you travel with me, it's, there no, there's no break. You start early, you finish late, you get some sleep, you get some food, sometimes on the run. But we had a beautiful experience over those three days. And at that Friday, when we were doing a debrief, and it was really a rich, uh, in fact, um, Angel Parham, who was one of the speakers there, uh, agreed to have lunch with our 18 people. And that was a beautiful conversation. It was a beautiful conversation. Anyway, that Friday afternoon, I said to the group, um, you know, the debrief. And at the end of it, I said, do you want to go in this direction? Mm -hmm. And this is why what an Anika's insight is so good. You know, I'm a conservative Republican, and I know that the politics of some of the people who work for me are not what I am. But that's OK. <laughs> to a person, to a person without reservation, they all wanted to take this journey. So when we got back, um, I don't let anything, you know, I don't let, uh, if this is a good moment, you got to take advantage of it. So I called together the boards of our four charter schools. There, there are five of them, but there are only four boards. And I uh, asked the, the group, and 12 of them were available to do it, to come and make a presentation to the board members. Yeah. What did they learn? Why did they want to do this? And it was very touching because they were all different with the common thing that this will take us to a place we need to go. Yes. Wow. yes. It was a beautiful yeah. thing. Yeah. So by organically trying um, to move in this direction is much better than just trying, you know, I could have just, you know, as the founder and CEO, all this stuff, but that would never then be able to plant the seeds into the garden that it's the garden that has to bear fruit. Uh, and that's really what this is about. Yes. Wow. Yes. Wow. That is amazing. Well, Anika, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, you serve as director of high quality curriculum and instruction at Johns Hopkins Institute for Educational po Education Policy. Uh, so tell us a little bit about the Institute, your work there, and then of course your work with, uh, with Corner School, Stone Schools moving forward, because I assume it's not going to end at we read your book, right? There's going to be there's going to be some involvement. So why don't yes. you share about that? Yes, I've been at the uh, the Johns Hopkins Institute for Education Policy. Next year it'll be one year. Um, and my it's, 
I wear several hats there in my role. Um, I support um, the Knowledge Map, which is um, the director of that is Amy Fuller. And what she does is an online way of um, assessing, you know, the quality of curriculum, covering different seminal topic areas and making sure different things are covered or not covered. And it's done very privately. We don't, you know, promote the, the, the findings for each school or publisher that wants us to do it. But it just shows them the weak areas, the strengths, you know, the points that they're hitting well, um, to, so they can know if they're, if they're if the curriculum is knowledge rich. Um, so that's the knowledge map, um, and then we make recommendations for that. And and Amy runs that, but I support that, help with the reviews, help with giving the reports and giving the curriculum suggestions. Then I have my own curated projects that I lead, um, and one of them will be something like Cornerstone. It's always designed by the client. They come to us with the specific need that they have, and if it fits the expertise that I have in education, then I design a project to help them reach that goal, but that project is connected to research so that for the client, and, 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 and we also believe that the work we do is not just for the client, but it is because we believe all of this work that we're doing with these individual clients is, or, or people who come to us is to um, give society a better understanding of, how, of education and what needs to be done to improve it. And so everything we do has to go beyond just, hey, let me help you with your curriculum. Let me help you make your school better. But there has to be some data, some type of, most times it's quantitative data to just show look, when we did this with this school, look what happened in their school. Look how the lives of the students changed. Look how their scores and their testing went up. Look how um, the mentality of teachers and the community changed as a result of this. And then that becomes some type of re report released out to the public so that other, others can learn about the implications that this project has for other schools and other learning communities. And so um, this project that I'm doing with Cornerstone is one that I've designed that is connected to looking at how this change in classical education, going from a, a, a traditional charter school into being a classical charter school will affect the thinking of the community, the, mm -hmm. the mindset of the community and their, their viewpoints on learning, um, their viewpoints on history and, and um, what, it, what is really, what is academic rigor? What does that really mean? And how does that help me reach my goals when I become an adult? And all of this will hopefully tell the world a story. Cause see, you know, one of the things that people, the mistake that people make about um, classical education is that it is racist, that it is white supremacist, that people who are bringing classical education into these um, various diverse communities have some type of political agenda. Um, and, you know, I go back to that and I think about the history of education in America. We as a country, I know my community, since we got out of uh, captivity, have fought for equal education, <laughs> have fought to have a rigorous, high quality education. All of Du Bois's writings are on this topic. It is a battle, and a Julia Cooper was constantly fighting. Martin Luther King has spoken on this. James Baldwin has spoken on this. Um, and I could go on and on. Even the Black Panther started their own school to address this problem. It has been a constant battle of... Um, I was watching Hidden Figures, like libraries, the Black library, not having high quality books just to read, that sometimes Black people had to sneak into the white library to get the quality books they needed to learn more, to expand their learning. Here we have charter schools, though, are going into these same communities and saying, we want to give you this, the very thing your ancestors yearn for. We're going to give it to you. And, and so we see evidence of this possibility. It could something like this close the knowledge gap, you know? What, what can happen in black communities? Are they gonna come through these schools and wanna vote for the, the next Republican candidate? No, that's not, what, that's not the message that's being taught there. It's simply people having a perspective that maybe we can heal what we're going through by providing this language, this literacy that all of our ancestors had of all races that will find themselves here in America. And maybe these tools will give them what they need 
to write things like letter from a Birmingham jail. Right. Like we're literally the charter schools that I visit Cornerstone now transitioning into this, but I think of Hillsdale, I think of Optima, I think of um, Cornerstone DC does this. Um, I think of Great Hearts. I think, and if I'm not mentioning your name, you know, charge it to my head, not to my heart. All of these schools have this, they, they're doing something very similar. I see black history. They're trying to bring in black history in light of its connection to how the canon has undergirded many black liberation movements. And they're trying to provide this way of giving our students access to another part of their heritage that has been kept from them so that they can become equal participants in our democratic process. And so that's what I see in Clark. And um, we definitely have different perspectives politically, but that's a whole nother conversation for another day. But <laughs> Episode one three of Anchor coming up. No, I'm just kidding. Right. <laughs> but, right. <laughs> but we do agree on this. We do agree that this education is for everyone, every child. You know, it's interesting. Um, and I'm and I'm grateful for the way Anika has framed this. Um, but if you want to take one little allegory, and it's uh, the allegory of the cave in yes. Plato's Republic. Yes. So what does it really mean? It's about that what Plato is trying to say in this conversation with Socrates is that we live in a world of shadows and reflections mm -hmm. and not in reality that we live in a world in which we are firmly convinced that we see these shadows on the wall as the reality. Yes. When in point of fact, they're not. Yes. And how do you then develop the discernment, which requires humility, which requires deep humility to look inside oneself yes. and say, how do I walk out of the cave into the sunlight and as, and as Churchill referred to the uplands, uh, the sunlit uplands, yes. uh, in order to really come into, uh, to come to grips with the things that are real and that are richly beyond ourselves. Yeah. The world is ultimately beyond ourselves. And we have this sense of living in the cave and limiting the true beauty yes. that has been created for us to live in. You know, and I, I think one thing people don't realize, everyone, all communities don't realize that America's creation and progress was one great big conversation. Sure was. You know, and so, and a lot of times the communities that places like Cornerstone will be serving and some of the other schools that I've mentioned, my school, the Living Water School is another school. It's not a charter school, but same vision is... um we it's a way of inviting these communities into the conversation historically there's been a, a desire to keep them out of the conversation but when i think of people like john lewis he said no 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 i'm going to insert myself into this conversation but he had to be equipped to do that and so when you look at the different um stories of especially let's if we just even let's put a microscope on american history when we, we think about the founding fathers, we only think it's only them. But we also realize that as America was created and established and through all of its pain, there is this other beautiful story that I see. And, you know, and some people get frustrated me because I always talk about this beautiful story in the midst of the other stuff. But, you know, as a, as a woman of faith, the Lord tells me to think on those things that are good and true and virtuous. So I choose to think about those things. If there be any virtue, if there be any, any praise, he admonishes us again, think on these things. So it's not that I'm forgetting my history. I am I'm I definitely think about it, but I don't stay there. And then I I hone in and I see this other beautiful story. And this beautiful story involved people like John Adams, John Quincy Adams, uh, Frederick Douglass, Abraham Lincoln, Martin Luther King, John F. Kennedy, and so on and so forth engaged in this great conversation there were arguments there was fighting there was i don't agree with you i don't want to have the kind of government you want to have uh, you know america wasn't it looks like it but america wasn't founded as a dictatorship it looks like it i know if anyone's listening to me but that's not really how it was founded it was founded to invite people to the conversation once america established who was all that all these people were all human 
no matter the shade of their skin, then we invite then we invite everyone to this great conversation. And so the role of these charter schools is saying that there's, we're not trying to indoctrinate you into a certain way. We're you know, regardless of what the founder may believe, and I'm not actually I'm not political at all because they all get on my nerves. But that's a whole, also another story. But my point is that we're we're saying we need your diverse opinions. We need your different worldviews so that America, this is, if you look at even the Congress, you have two sides of, gov, you know, you have two sides so that you can have this conversation, this argument in this structured way to hash out some really difficult decisions so we get closer and closer to America becoming a more perfect union. So these charter schools are engaged in training its students to be a part of that democratic process. It's the only way forward, you know. You know, one of the well, things that's, and I appreciate again what Awanika has teed this up in the way in which she has in her sort of low key, shy <laughs> manner, um, <laughs> that Cornerstone intentionally names our schools after a founder and a civil rights leader. That's, it. that's right. So we have Washington and Parks, we have Lincoln and King, Madison and Carver. Uh, Jefferson and Douglas. Now that's an interesting conversation. Yeah. <laughs> Adams and Adams and Young. Yes. But we do it because I we want that. ourselves and our kids and everybody to understand it's an unfolding story yes. with glory and failure, yes. but it's an unfolding story toward this more perfect union. Yes. And it's, it's really rich because there were differences of opinion uh, in the forming of this. The Harvard historian, Bernard Balin, mm. Uh, once remarked that one of the significant reasons the Declaration of Independence was so important, he said prior to the Declaration, people didn't focus very much on the question of slavery. It was people were used to it. It'd been a part of human history and whatever. And he said, but after 17, July 4, 1776, that's about all a lot of people wanted to talk about because yeah. the covenantal document of our country would recognize something that was inconsistent with the founding promise yeah. and this unfolding mm -hmm. conversation and effort to live to our promises is why this, um, you know, Ronald Reagan, I'm going to tell two things. Ronald Reagan said America is the last best hope uh, for the for the world. And Andrew Young on the phone call with me on Monday said the same thing, recognizing both men, recognizing the uniqueness of this experiment mm -hmm. that in good faith yeah. would allow this kind of conversation. And Andy yeah. always refers to the fact that the healing will come yes. through forgiveness yes. and gratitude. It cannot come through any other way because it's it's like carrying a grudge and it weighs you down. And what Anika said about focusing on the things that are good, forgiveness allows the deck to be clean and for people to re-see each other. Yes. That's a classical road. Yes. And and then another yes. good attribute in, in connection to that is when when the phrase when they say um classical education talks about the good, the true. So as we work through that forgiveness and see, this is what I love. I say classics or the canon is like a great equalizer. It kind of stabilizes things. It, it helps to neutralize as well so that you may come with your life and human experiences and you may come to this place where you're still hurting about that. When you share a book with someone, but uh, I wish I could remember that quote that Cormac, uh, he just passed away It's a great author. He wrote this book about how books have out of no matter what argument you're having, a book will bond you together like blood. And so what happens is when I myself, a, a black woman who goes through racist experiences, even today, has gone through them throughout her life, but she finds a book of someone written outside of my time. This is why, like you said earlier, Soren, that beyond 20 years ago, but before I was even born, hundreds of years ago. And I share that book with someone like Clark and I can talk to him about my experiences and he can talk to me about his experiences. 
and we may not always agree or come to a full uh, connection, but it creates a it creates a safe space to have these hard conversations, so that as we're working towards forgiveness, that forgiveness is rooted in truth, mm-hmm. and that we each are able to share where we're coming from from our human experiences, and then we figure out. And this book can inspire, a book can inspire us to think about, okay, this is who I am. This is who you are. Where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? And maybe this book gives some enlightenment for that process. Beautiful. Well, I think, and I think, thank you both for sharing. Um, in, in my time here with CLT and visiting so many schools, I think uh, the, the one thing that I've noticed in particular at classical schools um, it just feels different, right? And, and let's take the curriculum, you know, or maybe even pedagogy, but just you walk through the halls and there seems to be just a joy for learning, mm-hmm. right? That, that, that these schools instill this love for learning, that they want to know more about all these people, yeah. even people that don't look like them, right? They want to know more about the history. They want to learn the philosophy behind it. Uh, and I think part of that is, is also good teachers, Right. Mm-hmm. Like good teachers go into these schools having a heart for for this kind of education, but most importantly, having a heart for these children, yeah. wanting to pass down the best of what's been thought and said to them uh, and building up that next generation. Clark, uh, we've had many anchored episodes talking about kind of the the void or the, the leadership gap in, in, of teachers. Right. And we don't have enough to meet the demand. Um, if you can kind of share a little bit about, uh, you know, kind of. How are you trying to recruit or well, what would you tell maybe a young teacher that's listening that that is looking for for a challenge? Um, uh, what would you say to them uh, as they might be thinking about their next steps in their career? In a curious way, it's sort of simple. Everybody wants to know that their life counted for something. And it will count for even more when it's no longer about your life. It is about the life of those that you help. It's about the life of those that you learn with. And it's a rare opportunity to teach in an environment that is about the things we've been talking about for this last 45 minutes to an hour. And to bring a heart seeking not a job, but a calling, but also a chance to grow oneself. And there are many teaching jobs, and I'm not looking for people who want to fill a slot. I really am looking for people, and I'm just going to put it this way, even though we're a public school, I'm looking for people that God has called for such a time as this to be a part of this unfolding story, to be able to be more than just yourself, but to really be this person for others. Uh, And I know there are teachers out there who've been teaching for five years, 10 years, who've never taught yet. But all of them are people that are just waiting to be called and invited. And I've just invited you. If you want to come, come. Wow. What a a beautiful way to end end this episode and um, this two-part series. Uh, This has been an absolute joy. Um, If you want to learn more, uh, Clark, uh, tell us, uh, is it cornerstoneschools.org? Cornerstone, what's the what's the website to learn more? Well, should, I, should I give you my cell number? <laughs> <laughs> if you want to share it, absolutely. I'm sure we get a lot of calls. 248-672-0677. There you got it. Um, but we have, a, we have a Cornerstone website, uh, cornerstoneschools.org. Uh, my email is clarkdurant1936 at gmail.com. 1936 is not my date of birth. It is the date of the of the death of a great man. His name was Gilbert Keith Chesterton, a poet, an essayist, a journalist. Um, and I honor him uh, because he was a teacher as well and a great writer. So Clark Durant, 1936 at gmail.com, because this is a personal relationship. It's not just a job. Beautiful. Well, I, I appreciate the work that both of you do. I cannot wait to see... Anika, your role with with the Cornerstone Schools and 
and maybe we'll get you back on in a year and uh, two years from now, one year, two years from now, and kind of seeing some of that research. And I think yes. part of the challenge too in our movement is quantifying the things that are, that are so hard to quantify. Because yes. we oftentimes go back to, well, look at test scores. But there's yeah. so much more about what classical education does to the hearts, minds, and souls, not just of the individual, but of the community. And being mm -hmm. able to to take a look at that um, and, and then sharing your results with us uh, is yes. going to be is going to be a beautiful thing to behold. So, yes. uh, well, Soren, Anika, I'm very, yeah. Soren, I'm very grateful to you. You've done a wonderful job, uh, obviously, with CLT. Uh, and but I, I appreciate you bringing Anika and me to to have this conversation together. Um, we also ought to bring uh, Angel into this. And then you want to watch. I'm just going to be blunt about this. These two fabulous black women. And it's <laughs> exciting and it's really a joy. But it shows and this is why it's so rich. It shows that this conversation is one that the country is hungry for. Yes, I'm yeah. grateful to the, I'm grateful to Anika and to Angel for taking the risk to put this out there and let the light shine so that these good things can be done. I mean, CLT may want to consider subsequent, like just to kind of, it's an unfolding story. Like, well, this has never been done before. This has no. never been, and the, and the world needs to understand that this project that Clark and I are embarking on, it's never been done where you have two people who are very different come together for this common purpose around classical education in an underserved community and are able to tell the story of what happens we've talked about it we can give different testimonies with data to show yeah. what happens when you bring classical education to these communities so clt partnering with us in this way maybe others who are listening would want to hear what is happening as this story unfolds? Well, we're going to make sure we do everything in our power um, and our ever more hopefully growing brand to make sure that people hear about this. And we'll definitely have you back. Uh, Anika, Clark, thank you both so much for sharing your story and joining us today at Anchored. Thank you, Soren. Our pleasure.